Welcome to Coffee with Cornelius. In this episode, we are talking about standardized testing, classical education, what a true education really means. And if you enjoyed this content, please like and hit the subscribe button if you want to see more. My guest today is Jeremy Wayne Tate. He is the CEO of the Classic Learning Test, an alternative to the SAT and ACT standardized tests. Mr. Tate holds a bachelor's, bachelor's degree excuse me, from Louisiana State University and a master's from Reformed Theological Seminary. After working as a college counselor and admissions test prep consultant, he founded Classic Learning Initiatives in 2015 to provide a test, the Classic Learning Test, CLT, rooted in Western tradition and classical learning. It is an alternative to the SAT and the ACT. Uh, it is in its fifth year and recognized by over 180 universities across Canada and the United States. It is composed of three sections, verbal reasoning, grammar writing, and quantitative reasoning. The CLT has a number of advocates in academia, including Robert George of Princeton University. And uh, Jeremy, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Cornelius, for having me. Uh, so based on my research, I'd like to talk about you first. Before we get into the CLT, I'd like to talk a little bit about you and, and maybe a bit about your personal motivations for doing this. So based on my research, you were a Presbyterian and then you converted to Catholicism. Mm -hmm. And I find this just noticing this anecdotally that a lot of Protestants who become Catholic do it after they have immersed themselves in church history and a little bit on the Western canon. Is that what happened to you? Yeah, I think it was the last thing I expected to happen when I was in seminary, mm -hmm. uh, Reformed Theological Seminary in D.C., which is a Calvinist, uh, in the Calvinist Reformed tradition. Uh, and the first class I ever took was actually an ancient church history class. And so we deep dive into uh, the early church and the sacraments. And um, pretty quickly, I, I started to think that these people, to me, didn't look like early Calvinists. Uh, they, they seemed to be pretty obsessed with the Eucharist, pretty into Mary. Uh, things that were just weird to me at the time uh, as a as a Calvinist. And is that something you could reconcile with your Calvinist faith at the time? You know, no, it, it wasn't. And, and you know, my, my story in seminary was actually, I, at the time I was uh, living in a parsonage, I was working for a youth group, uh, and mm. I was actually just planning a large group Bible study, and, and I was doing it, I think, on Galatians 5. And uh, there it talks about uh, the, the works of the, the evil spirit, or I, I can't remember the, the language, um, and talks about factions and divisions I had assumed it was maybe a hundred or 200. And then I saw this crazy number of like 40,000 and led Sorry, to that's 40,000 sects of Protestantism. Is that right? Yeah. So, I mean, it's hard to say exactly how many, but 20 to wow. 40 for sure. It's a lot. Yeah. You know, and as a historian, um, you know, I, I was drawing a line between uh, the reformation to modernity, uh, which in some ways has become, profoundly anti-Christian mm -hmm. uh, in many ways. And so say, man, there, maybe there was something actually embedded in the Reformation. That's, so did your Christian faith influence your decision at the end to start the Classic Learning Initiative? I know initially you were a counselor and you were a test take, you were test taking admissions counselor and you advised college students on this, right? Was this your Christian faith eventually led you into this classical learning model? Yeah, so in seminary, it was the first time I, I got a really deep sense of how other generations had been educated, uh, which was new. And I was also pretty rattled of, of thinking that it was really different. But it was the same for centuries, like the same century after century after century. And then mm. modern education in 21st century America was like totally different. You know, and like this is really interesting. This is weird. So to me, that was the kind of my, the way I discovered classical education. At the time, I wouldn't have called it that. And I had no idea that there was this whole classical education movement going on, which I eventually kind of got into Catholicism and CLT was the fact that Catholicism kind of derailed my professional life. I was going to become a pastor. So I needed to put food on the table for four kiddos. And the easy way to do that was SAT prep. And I started an SAT prep company in 2014. And I did it, you know, with that, a deep dive into the SAT. And I got really familiar with the source material and the content and thought, wow, like at best, this test is just boring, but at worst, it's, it's kind of aggressively secular and, and has such a big influence on American education. Um, yeah, so that was kind of how, how I got, got to where I'm at right now. So for those of us who have never heard of this idea before, what is classical education exactly? Yeah, we have, what is classical education? So I, Cornelius, Cornelius, I always like to say uh, classical education, formerly known as education. 
talking about when he describes education as simply the soul of a society as it passes from one generation to the next. Um, and so the books that were foundational, the intellectual tradition that were foundational in, uh, in the birth of America, uh, John Locke and the political theory, you know, that he had inherited, uh, that goes all the way back through the Greek fathers, Aristotle, Plato, Socrates. Um, this was the intellectual tradition that goes through, you know, the Middle Ages and Dante and Aquinas, um, that very much America's founding identity, uh, for sure. Um, and, and really, I mean, you look at, at the, the genius in some ways of the American system of government, um, which right now is being lost to students because mm -hmm. education is now divorced from the classical tradition. Um, and so it's, it's such a big thing. It's super hard to define. Cornelius, I think what we're talking about here is, is the, the end goal. So the end goal for classical education is the cultivation of wisdom and virtue. And by virtue, I don't mean like new age virtue signaling. What I mean is at least um, the, the four cardinal virtues, uh, temperance, prudence, fortitude, and justice. Justice, yeah. And, um, uh, and, and also probably the seven lively virtues I would include uh, as well in, in the Catholic intellectual tradition. And so that's the, the purpose of classical education, the cultivation of wisdom and virtue. The purpose of mainstream secular progressive education is just college and career readiness. Um, and the irony, of course, is that when education is simply aimed at college and career readiness, you end up with people who aren't even ready for college and career because they've been, neg they've been neglected to be formed in, the, in kind of the whole person. Mm -hmm. So it's, it Right now, it's sort of a functional education, right? It's basically, we want you to get the highest paying job that you can, go to the best college that you can. We want you to do these SATs, ACTs. You know, some parents, okay, let's, let's be real though. Some parents might just look at that and say, that's exactly what I want for my kids. I want them to be rich. I want them to be successful. I want them to marry well, and I, I want them to get a good job, right? So um, how does classical education hurt? help me right how does it help my kid at, in, at all mm -hmm. yeah you know in the yeah. age of automation you know that mm -hmm. we're, we're quickly going into it's, it's interesting when you think about any skills that they're going to be teaching in in k through 12 can all pretty much be you know surpassed by, by automation and technology mm -hmm. the only thing they can't is a well-grounded ethically formed human I, uh, and that is what is going to, you know, as an employer, that is what is in high demand right now. Uh, and so that is, you know, I, I, classical education makes the most employable people. And I think one of the reasons CLT has done this really crazy thing where we, out of the gate, people said, there's no way this can happen. Nobody can go up against SAT and ACT. We've got a bunch of bookies around here. We've got a bunch of people who read entirely too much. We have uh, a bunch of liberal arts majors in the true sense of the word. They're, they went to St. John's College in Hillsdale and those kinds awesome. of things. And they make incredible employees. And I think that's one of the reasons CLT is, has been able to do what it's been able to do. Yeah, I would agree. I think that now employers are looking for adaptability. If things are going to be changing so much due to automation, then of course people need to be adaptable. And I guess a classical education, one of the outcomes of that is that adaptability in the face of tempestuous change. Um, let's talk about the state of today's educational system and why a classical education might be needed. So in a professional, in a professional capacity, because I'm going to be getting these students, I was talking with a social studies teacher and I asked her, you know, what are the kids learning in terms of Canadian history? Are they learning about confederation? Are they learning about uh, Canada's role in World War II, the Avro Arrow, John A. Mac John A. Macdonald, maybe Mackenzie King, all of these prime ministers. Are we learning about Pierre Trudeau? Are we learning about Quebec sovereignty? And she said, no, 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 we're not learning about these things. It's a high school social studies teacher. I teach them about things like cultural appropriation. <laughs> I teach them about things like intersectionality. I'm going to make my point of view perfectly clear on this. I actually have no problem with talking about these ideas. I think it's perfectly fine. I think they're ideas, and I think as ideas, they deserve to be talked about and debated. And if a student wants to adopt them as their own ideas, fine. I don't think that's a bad thing. Yeah. My issue is I think you need a certain amount of foundational knowledge before you can even begin to grasp what these ideas are responding to, because they are responding to something. And uh, I think that's, that's a pernicious outcome of today's mm. education is that it introduces these philosophies very quickly and too soon. In your estimation, to what extent is this a problem? I know you're in the United States, so it might be different there. 
Yeah, it, it is such a problem. And, 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 you know, it seems to me that if you look at it, like, what even is education? Like, what is it? Mm-hmm. Uh, again, if, if it's the passing on of tradition and culture, and it seems like you can go to any, any society, any culture, any time and place in the history of the world, and that education was basically this transmission of values and culture and wisdom. But if, if mainstream 21st century American education is distinctly not that, then what is it? And what it ends up being is actually the exact opposite. It ends up being the undoing uh, of these things instead. And I, I think parents are waking up to this, Cornelius. I think a lot of families now, especially it's been one of the outcomes of COVID, where they're actually taking a look at some of the nonsense that, that, that their kids are being taught, right? Yeah, Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. and, and you really can't, I mean, there's no way to have any perspective on 21st century America without having immersed yourself in history. You know, my, my parents, uh, when I was in, in college, they were in France, and it wasn't until I spent a lot of time with them in Lyon that I really clear, a new, and it's the same way with, with classical education, when you're immersed into the, the classical world, um, you suddenly actually get a much more uh, focused picture of 21st century. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, I don't want to try to castigate every single social studies teacher. I've met some really wonderful social studies teachers. I'd like to talk about when this happened in education history. It seems that in the universities where they teach education to future teachers, they they might be teaching ideas that are are quite radical and i've noticed this is this true was there a change in the way teachers were taught how to teach in the history of education that kind of allowed them to adopt these maybe radical philosophies that shouldn't be taught to kids at too soon an instant yeah and it's one of the actually one of the staffing problems you know at, at our challenges at, at great heart so right now you have all of these classical schools exploding across america right now but where do you find great teachers that haven't been fed the, the american education brace of john dewey kind of factory model of education that neglected the cultivation again of wisdom and virtue uh, in favor of this new idea that's just about kind of making somebody employable uh, able to follow directions and um and, you know, one of the, the most visible, uh, palpable outcomes of this is, um, is just boredom. The kids are painfully bored. Now, I remember as a teacher, students, when I would teach, especially in World War II and Hitler, even the most checked out kid was like super dialed in when you talk about <laughs> Hitler. And the reason why is because yeah. they were interested in, in good and evil. And they wanted yeah. to talk about things like good and evil. Uh, but we, we neglect that and now in the education system. Uh, and so you end up with a bunch of complacent students that are just bored and they're, they're being kind of taught some, some PC sensitivities and, and whatnot. But you know, especially in, in America where you, know, you look at the First Continental Congress, you look at the um, entirety, uh, every one of the founders um, was classically educated. It's all there was, of course. Uh, and compare that to the current, I think it's 116th Congress. You know, it's a, it's a different body of thinking uh, about our founding documents because of education. And so, yeah, I, I don't know the landscape of Canada nearly as well, but there's an absolute crisis, an absolute crisis going on in American education right now. Um, I'd actually like to take you up on the issue of the American founding fathers. And I'd like to issue a few challenges you might come across. And I, I'm just going to issue those challenges because I think you can deal with those challenges. You've th- obviously thought about them uh, very That's deeply. Fun. You're a Christian and, you know, you believe, of course, that the founding fathers were classically educated. Uh, there's a few things, though, that someone might come back at and, and say about the founding fathers. Number one, if they were classically educated, if this classical education is supposed to cultivate virtue, is it, if it's supposed to cultivate the good, the, be- the truth, the beautiful, right? The yeah. good, the true, the beautiful. If that's what it's supposed to cultivate, why were these men uh, so evil in many ways? Why did they own slaves? Why did they, uh, you know, deceive each other diplomatically? Why did they do yeah. these kinds of things? How would you respond to, to that? Yeah, I, I think the, the form that slavery took in America is one of the most ghastly, horrible in the history mm. of slavery. But slavery itself, of course, goes far beyond American slavery, which was unique in that it was, it was, it was racial. Uh, and that's why there's such horrible long-term dire consequences of what, what happened here. Um, but you go, you can go back much further into, into the Roman Empire where you had otherwise seemingly virtuous men and leaders who 
had slaves, you know? Uh, and so I, I think that there is, you know, right now CLT, just to give you one example uh, of, of the hypocrisy that's across the board, CLT is a company, right, but right now we're reading the souls of black folk. folk. And uh, Du Bois was, um, his view of women is not, is not good. You know, mm. guy who founds the NCAA, NAACP, he's a leader in, in terms of black academia in America. Um, and I have some dear friends, uh, Anika Prather, who's on our board, um, who loves Du Bois. Uh, she's a, a, a black woman who also recognizes, he said pretty bad things about, about women, but she doesn't chuck out all of Du Bois because of how he was so wrong on such a big issue. So you have somebody like Thomas Jefferson, you know, the man owned six or 700 slaves. Um, he wow. owned slaves that were his family members. He likely probably fathered uh, several children with, with Sally Hemings. Um, I think the majority of historians I've talked to are, are coming to consensus on that, that that's very likely. He was 45, she was 15, right? This Thomas Jefferson is a founding father, you know? Yeah. But you also look at T. Thomas Jefferson, uh, who was a Renaissance man, second to none. You know, here's a guy who was at the top of, of architecture and philosophy and rhetoric, and who read in, in multiple languages, French and Greek and Latin. Um, and so a deeply flawed man, a man who himself, you know, was not a Christian and, and probably didn't think a whole lot, therefore, about the concept of sin. I think you eventually get to a point of saying, well, we can chuck everything and start again at kind of year zero and kind of try everything again. Or we can, we can identify people as respectable and heroes who had um, some really dark sides to them uh, as well. You know, and, and I think Cornelius too, of some of the mainstream popular issues today of like, take, take abortion, you know, how many thought leaders are going to be really vocal on, on and how many Hollywood stars are going to be really vocal in standing up for the right to life uh, for the unborn. You know, it's not a popular thing to do where who knows, maybe in 200 years, we'll look back at this time period and be like, man, remember when we did this horrible thing, you know, to the unborn, you know, that's, that's very possible. And so, you know, people are always going to be a product to some degree of their time and place. Uh, and I think that's, that's true of the founding fathers as well. I'm just wondering where you would draw the line, though. I know Thomas Jefferson, you mentioned all of these horrible things he's done, and I don't think anybody can disagree with that. But, I mean, if you were to take somebody uh, who worked in the administration of the National Socialists or Mussolini's Italy, and this person, you know, the, this, the foundation of the Nazis and fascism was based in some sense on, on German... Uh, resurgent literature and this idea of the German people as one blooded yeah. people, you know, and it kind of goes back to even Indian uh, literature, Shakuntala and all of these classical Vedas. Um, you could say that these people were drawing upon a virtuous tradition, but of, of course the outcomes were completely horrendous, right? So I, I mean, I'm not trying to compare Thomas Jefferson to Hitler, obviously, but I'm asking, <laughs> yeah. I'm asking where you would draw the the line in upholding a historical figure as virtuous or not. Obviously, everybody has done bad things. You know, even Gandhi now, we're told that Gandhi had uh, horrible, horrible views about black people. He had horrible views about women. Um, he had very weird sexual practices he engaged in. And yet he was a, a great leader who led India to uh, freedom over the British in a nonviolent manner. So, yeah. you know, where, where do we dissect and where do we discern what kinds of things from the past are good or not? Yeah, yeah. And I, I think this is where Christians have uh, a high calling in the mm -hmm. world, you know, and in that instead of primarily identifying evil uh, out there, we start by first identifying it in here and in, in our own, own human heart. Mm -hmm. I think that that alone radically changes the conversation, you know, and so... Um, and, and look, I, I, I don't know, honestly, like, should Robert E. Lee come down? Should Jefferson come down? I feel like, you know, as a white man in America, uh, I'm doing a lot of, of listening right now, honestly, a lot of reading. Um, I don't, I don't know where you draw uh, the line or even if it gets to decide which heroes are, are held up as, and who can we really even agree on? I mean, I'm seeing some of the attacks on Lincoln and there are in the, the mass uh, uh, volumes of, of things Lincoln said, he said things at times that 
could easily be construed in a 21st century context as racist. Yeah. You know, and so we've even seen attacks on Lincoln. And so you're going to end up with, with no one standing uh, at all. And there is no culture. There is no history. There are no heroes, um, which I think is going to be super deadly and super toxic and really the end of a civilization. Or we say, you know what? These were deeply flawed people who also did amazing, great things. And I think we see the full range uh, of the human, human experience, the human person, you know, within that. So uh, it's a really thoughtful question, though, and it's, it's a hard one. Uh, I'd like to just jump around a little bit. You say, you know, the civilization is going to end. It's going to fall. Maybe it is. I think Western civilization might be on its tail end. Uh, but you're a Christian. I'm a Christian. And we both uphold St. Augustine as a saint. In his classic mm -hmm. work, City of God, he comments about Roman civilization crumbling around him as the barbarians are sacking Rome and as they're yeah. invading Roman territory. He argues that for Christians, our city is an eternal city in heaven. Earthly dominions will eventually fall. Given Augustine's words, why bother trying to preserve the temporary artifacts of Western civilization? Now, Cornelius, I love that you, you asked that question. I have such sweet memories. My, my first three years out of college were in New York City teaching in New York City public schools, and I would sit on the metro and for six months just read City of God. It's a big old Amazing. Big, you know, <laughs> uh, and it was super formative to me yeah. at the time. I think I've quoted Chesterton several times now, but Chesterton says that, you know, Christianity has died several times, but it has always been reborn because it has a God who knows his way out of the grave. And uh, I think that's where authentic Christianity is always going to be um, a seed of human flourishing uh, and beautiful culture. Uh, and so I think, you know, right now, it's, and it's a lot that I'm reading and trying to understand and so many questions I have right now for uh, all the various kind of roots of decay. I think the decline of education, traditional education has been certainly probably the main one, the way that I view mm -hmm. it. Um, but yeah, uh, and I may be getting, getting off from your initial question. So may I ask you to actually repeat that if you can. Yeah. So why bother trying to preserve Western civilization if it's going to crumble anyway, if our ultimate aim is the city of God and not the city of men, which is, you know, founded on temporal standards yeah. as opposed to eternal standards. Yeah. So our philosophy at CLT, uh, we quote the English poet Matthew Arnold a lot, who referred to kind of, kind of the Western canon uh, as, as the best of what has been thought and said. Mm -hmm. And so the reason the Western canon is valuable is certainly not because it's a bunch of dead white people. I think that we've really got to ask everybody to be thoughtful and thinking this through, right? The Actually, many of them were not even white. Yes. They were you. Arab or they were black or they were, yeah. you know, Middle Eastern, who knows? Yeah. 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 And, and, you know, Ben Sass points out in his book, he's talking about a rejects having to read Shakespeare to um, her inner city class. And he raises the question of like, wait, wait a minute. Can they not relate to love? and tragedy, mm -hmm. the things that make us most human, that are most universal. And so the Western canon, the Western tradition at its very best, I think has clearly articulated the, the things actually that are most universal and that are not even tied only to the Western, Western canon. You know, the human, the whole concept that we have of human rights is deeply embedded in the Western canon. It's deeply embedded in, in Christian uh, Imagio Dei, the, the, the being made in the image of God. Um, and so to get rid of it uh, is to get rid of, of, of a lot of truth in the way that we've learned to articulate. When you're talking about a Western canon, and I think a classical learning model, to be honest, is going to presume the existence of a Western canon, isn't there a danger that such a canon is subjected, subjective and even potentially dangerous? So some people might say, let's include a dangerous sexual pervert like the Marquis de Sade in the Western canon. This is a guy who argued in favor of all kinds of disgusting things like sadomasochism and bestiality, uh, pedophilia, incest. Um, yeah. Isn't there, a, I mean, I, of course, I'm not saying that that's the only guy who would be included, but even within the Western canon, if you look at Greek philosophy, Greek mythology, there's all kinds of perversion in there. Um, so isn't there a danger if the aim is to cultivate virtue? Uh, should the Western canon, if there is a Western canon, be uh, something that is more objectively decided upon before you launch into a classical learning type of model? 
Yeah, you know, one of the never ending conversations at CLT is around the CLT author bank. And so there's yeah. about 210 or so authors on there. And so a lot of the usual suspects you may think from, from Boethius and Aristotle and Plato, Fred Flannery O'Connor, C.S. Lewis, Frederick Douglass, Martin Luther King Jr., Du Bois, a great, but, and there's a lot of arguing over that list. And so we've got a great board of academic advisors with college presidents. And actually, we've got the, the, the founder of National Black Home Educators on there. Uh, and there's a lot of really healthy debate that we let go on and on and on about what is this list? What is the Western canon? So I think there are some things where they're so central. They're so foundational. Uh, Augustine, the city of God is a great example of that. Yeah. You know, that we're, we're, we're committing in some way civil. And the Bible. God. Yeah, yeah. To just toss these out entirely. But then there are also, you know, authors and ideas that are more on the margins and that are certainly up for debate. So I'd like to take you up on that a little bit because the Western canon, uh, to be fair, seems to be biased towards uh, Greece. It seems to be biased towards Western Europe. Uh, there's a, There are a few Russians on there. You might have Dostoevsky throw in Pasternak and a few other Russians, throw in a few um, uh, splattering of, of African Americans and, and Asians too. Um, but for example, the Indian Vedas and the Indian Vedic tradition rivals Greek philosophy and actually their mathematics superseded Greek philosophy and mathematics, and yet it wouldn't be emphasized in the classical learning model. So is it fair to privilege Western sources to the exclusion of beautiful and intelligent and even virtuous works from the near and far east? Yeah, and so we, we want to, and that's where I think when you look at the CLT author bank, it's not, uh, if you look at it quickly, somebody might say, oh, the Western canon. If you look at it a little more closely, it's actually not in any way tied to the Western canon. The philosophy is to reconnect knowledge and virtue. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, you know, as I was saying earlier, no matter what culture you look at, time, place, century, whatever, education always seemed to be about the passing down of wisdom, virtue, truth, culture from one generation to the next. And so, you know, we're, we're, we're very open and we do uh, include uh, source material from you know, a wide range of places. And what we say internally is, look, when you have people who are pointing to the same uh, enduring ideals um, from all these different places, it actually strengthens the argument. You know, what we're appealing to uh, is universal. And it's not something that's just from white European kind of imperialistic culture, but that it's something that speaks to the core of what it means to be human. So mm -hmm. yeah, we, we keep that conversation open. And we're also going to, we're, we're trying to bring on more people who are well-versed in Eastern expand and, and bring the right people to the table. That, that's fantastic. And I think that's a, that's a good view to hold. I think every culture can have some kind of a virtue. I, I also think that the approach that you're taking, if, is it fair to say that you're, you'd like to cultivate discernment, right, in, in the students so that the student will be able to discern in the future if they want to go out and maybe read a book or something, they'll be able to discern, okay, is this something worth my time to read or is this just uh, something that maybe I shouldn't read? Maybe it's something I can bracket for the moment. Yeah, I, I can't tell you the number of times. My, I, I taught for almost 10 years in the public school environment. And the last couple, as I was becoming really skeptical with just the whole thing, I would ask students, like the first day of class, I would say, why are we here? Uh, and they probably thought I was kind of crazy, but they would say, to get a better job. You know, like, you know if you think about it, like, it is. right on the board, what Plato said, the object of education is to learn to love what is beautiful. And they look at that like, what? Like, what does that even mean? What are they, what are they even talking about? Um, and so, yeah, that, that may again, may have, got, have gotten away from your question again. So repeat that if you would. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, I think my question was, actually, now I forget my question. So I'm just going to move on to the next question. Uh, the next question is this. And this is something I actually get from Christians a fair bit, right? Christians yes. will say this to me sometimes. They'll say, what's the point of learning about the American founding fathers and the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence? These men were deists. And in the worst case, they were Masons. They were Freemasons, which is just satanic. Yeah. How would you respond to that? Yeah, I wouldn't deny or argue with somebody who's going to make a case that the founding fathers from Franklin and many others were, were fundamentally DS Unitarians. Um, but they were also realists. Um, and uh, they either subscribed uh, to a Christian understanding of sin 
um, as somebody like Patrick Henry clearly did, and, and many more, George Washington himself did, uh, practicing Anglican uh, his, his entire life. Um, and this is baked into the Constitution. So the reason the, the U.S. Constitution is brilliant is because it rightly accounts for human nature. It's mm -hmm. why it checks and balances. Uh, that's the whole genius of it is because they understood that humans are bent towards corruption. Uh, and so we account for that. And that's why that, that's why it actually works. Here's something I'd like to know. I mean, the CLT, I think it's been very successful over uh, five years. You guys have got 180 universities on board. What's your take up? Like how many students per year uh, on average would you say write the CLT? Yeah, so for us, uh, so the last year, I think, last academic year, I think this year we were maybe 30, 35,000 or so. The mm -hmm. one for this, we were about 25. Um, you know, so for us, you know, the reason we're doing this is not because we think standardized testing is just super awesome. It's fine and it's helpful in being a snapshot of academic progress. But at the end of the day, you know, it is high stakes testing that really does drive mainstream national curriculum. Mm -hmm. So just to give you an example of what I'm talking about, if you do as a quick thought experiment, let's say that, SAT and ACT, and they said, okay, we're going to have a required French portion on the SAT starting in 2024. Then everybody's going to teach French. Exactly. <laughs> Everyone's exactly. going to start. I would love that. I think yeah. that would be great, actually. Yeah. So, yeah. so the idea with CLT <laughs> is, is saying, wait a minute, what if we say students need to demonstrate their ability to read and understand the best of what has been thought and said? Mm. And so that includes anyone from Aristotle to Nietzsche, to Darwin, to C.S. Lewis, to Du Bois, to Frederick Douglass, to these giants uh, that we have very much latched on to at CLT. Fantastic. Cultivating the mind and cultivating the soul as well. Um, so where can we find you? Where can we find you, Jeremy? Where are you online? You're on Twitter. I know you have a CLT website, so why don't you plug those Yeah, us? yeah. So cltexam.com is always a great spot. Uh, I, mm -hmm. I kind of fun. I'm kind of embarrassed to admit it. You know, I, I avoided Twitter like the plague for years. And then I it's got probably a good idea. <laughs> yeah. And then I got on it in January. Yeah. It's been really, really good. A great way to kind of build the platform and get the word out for what we're trying to do. So that, that's yeah. my hand at Jeremy Tate 41. Um, yeah, those would be the two best places. And you can D DM me on Twitter if you want to chat. For sure. Yeah, I'll put your link to Twitter and the website. Uh, on my description box in the YouTube and in, if you're listening to this on Spotify, I'll also put that in the description box on Spotify or wherever else you might be listening to this. So thank you so much, Jeremy. I appreciate it. And uh, you take care. Good, Best of luck with what you're doing. It's a great uh, initiative. Thanks so much, Cornelius. Thanks for having me. Cheers.